Okay. So I'm in Proverbs 29 again. Proverbs 29, verse 14. <laughs> and um, I'm going to read it um, paragraph-wise, not verse-wise, okay? So Proverbs 29, 14. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. So this sets the tone for the next um, two or three paragraphs. Next paragraph, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. And when the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous will see their fall. Next paragraph, correct your son and he'll give you rest. Yes, he'll give delight to your soul. But where there's no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. Next paragraph, a servant will not be corrected by mere words, for though he understands, he will not respond. Do you see a man hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than him. He who pampers his servant from childhood will have him as a son in the end. All right, so last night I talked about, um, you know, um, that fathers discern what's lacking in their sons and they, or what they're being robbed of or what's limiting them. And, um, and, and they, um, they assess that uh, accurately and they, um, you know, and they, they actually... Um, uh, speak into those things, uh, and it establishes their their position of fathering, you know, forever. And then the next thing was about the rod and rebuke, which gives wisdom. Um, but if it doesn't, then there's um, there's shame, there's wickedness that gets multiplied, etc. Um, and th the reason is because um, of what the Hebrew language actually says, which is translated rod and rebuke. Um, the Hebrew word for rod means to branch off. In other words, to go off track. And the word for rebuke actually means to argue the right. So in other words, what fathers do is when they assess that um, something's wrong with the son, where, that a son's branched off, then they argue the right. They speak the truth into the situation. Um, they don't leave the son or the child to themselves or to their own devices because that only ends up in, in, in problems. Then the next paragraph, correct your son and he will give you peace. That means to instruct, to shape, to mold uh, your son. And, um, and so fathers, um, this is part of their role is to instruct their, their sons. And we're talking about spiritual fathering, to instruct their, their spiritual sons, to shape them, to mold them by speaking truth into their lives. And it says that then, um, you know, the son will give the, the father peace. The son will give the father rest and, and the son will be a delight. Um, but where a father doesn't speak truth um, and to shape and mold a son, then a, a son will end up without having clear vision, without having progressive revelation, um, uh, without having prophetic insight. And, uh, and that means that the son ends up uh, casting off restraint, which again harks back to branching off. And um, but it says, happy is he who keeps the law. So as fathers actually speak truth and the ways of God into their spiritual sons, um, then uh, there's peace, uh, they're a delight, and the sons are happy. Um, and so uh, uh, Solomon's just given us some really simple but very profound keys uh, to do with um, fathering. And of course, uh, the, the success of our fathering in these things is determined by the response of the son. And... Um, but the interesting thing is I want to, I, I, I talked about a little bit about correction, about instruction, shaping and molding last night. But tonight I want to, to talk about that further. I want to talk, um, uh, go to Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> and, um, and, and the final paragraph I read, I'll deal with that on Monday. Uh, and by the way, um, uh, the stuff that's actually in there in the original language is uh, pretty, pretty amazing. It's incredible. Um, and, and I was going to do that tonight, but I just really felt I needed to um, um, talk a bit more about this concept of correction from a biblical perspective. Uh, and, um, um, and I'll just have to wait over the weekend to be able to talk about the other stuff on Monday. <laughs> All right. So Hebrews 12 uh, from verse 5 to 11. All right. Are we all, have we all got that? Cool. Okay. Hebrews 12 verse 5. You've forgotten the exhortation which, speak to, to, which speaks to you as sons. And here's the exhortation. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be dis discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. 
there's some pretty heavy language in there in the, in the English. Uh, but it's important that we know, um, you know, what the original language was because the English language has changed much over time. All right. Then he goes on and he says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. Uh, for what son is there whom a father does not chasten? In fact, if we're a son, that's what a father does. All right. Um, and, and, um, uh, and true fathers, they, they do this with their sons. But we're gonna, I'm going to explain what chastening really means. Then he says, but if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate, not sons. Furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he, but he that is the Lord God, uh, he chastens for our profit that we may, may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. All right, so there's some key words in here. The first one, of course, which comes up most of all is chastening. And it's in the same ballpark as correction. Um, you know, correction in the Old Testament uh, is similar to chastening in the New Testament. Um, and it's, it's really to do with shaping and molding uh, a son's life. So it's not necessarily punitive. It can ha um, have some kind of punishment involved, but it's not primarily punitive. Uh, whereas the word chastening as an English word, I think for most English speaking people, it's primarily punitive. But um, the, 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 um, the Greek concept is not firstly punitive. It's actually about shaping and molding a child's life or a son's life. And so this is what, our heavenly father does with us he wants to shape and mold us and so the um uh, the punitive stuff or the disciplinary stuff is actually last resort because his first um uh actions are to actually um instruct uh to um you know to bring correction in the sense of speaking truth into our lives uh the holy spirit reveals truth into our lives uh, and he, and he se seeks to use his word to, to shape and mold us to become true sons. And so this is actually what spiritual fathers are to do because they carry the heart of the heavenly father. And so it's not about um, being punitive. It's not about uh, being disciplinary, but it's firstly about um, drawing attention to the things that are important, like we talked about uh, that Paul said about Timothy and, and to the Corinthian church. Um, and, um, and so a father draws attention to things that are important. Uh, he instructs, he speaks truth uh, to shape and mold uh, the son. And of course, to speak truth firstly shapes and molds a son's thinking. And, um, and we know that the Bible says that uh, as a person thinks in their heart, so they are. So th this is the, the very important role of a spiritual father is to speak into the life of a spiritual son to bring instruction, to bring correction in the sense of adjustment according to truth, to shape and mould um, a spiritual son's thinking because that will outwork in a changed life and also in a cha in changed relationship. And so, so this concept of chastening, um, you know, I think for most of us, uh, you know, when we think of being chastened, we think of someone getting in our face and, you know, putting something on us and uh, whatever. Uh, but that's actually not where chastening begins uh, biblically. Um, and so if we, if we think about it as uh, our Heavenly Father shaping and molding us as sons, and therefore this is the primary role of spiritual fathers, then uh, it says, um, if we go back to the beginning of this passage, my son, do not despise the shaping and molding of the Lord. All of a sudden it's different. And then he says, um, whom the Lord loves, he shapes and molds. And so that all of a sudden there's a different perspective in, in everything that's being said here. <clears throat> so God doesn't um, punish us because he loves us. That's not what it's saying. All right? At the end of the day, if that's last resort, obviously he'll do whatever it takes. But his primary thing is to shape and mold our lives by revealing truth to us, by speaking into our lives. And if he has to, he will... Um, um, allow circumstances to happen uh, that will get our attention 
uh, etc., etc. But we're not to despise our heavenly Father's shaping and moulding of our lives as His sons. Um, he does this because He's our Father, and, and as a Father, He loves us. And um, and then it says, if you endure chastening, in other words, if you continue to allow Him to shape and mould you, because again, the word endure has has some negative connotations to us. In other words, I, you know, I've got to endure this stuff from my heavenly father. Now it's not negative. It actually simply means if we continue to allow him to shape and mold our lives, um, then, then we become partakers of something with him. And um, not only that, but if we continue to um, uh, allow him to shape and mold us, um, we know that he's dealing with us as sons. And this is the thing about, about uh, spiritual fathers, that if we can, as sons of our heavenly father, if we can really understand what's being said here, then we act, it actually change our, changes our relationship to, to spiritual fathers. Um, and, um, and so he says, if you endure chastening, in other words, if you follow through with the shaping and molding, that's really what it's talking about. Why? Because what son is there whom the father does not want to shape and mold? Any good father wants to shape and mold his, his children's lives, his son's lives. And so it is with, um, uh, you know, with spiritual fathers. And then he says, but if you are not being shaped and mold by a spiritual father, all right, then you're an illegitimate son. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? So true sons are those who have spiritual fathers who love them enough to shape and mold their lives and to speak truth into their lives. And, um, <clears throat> um, but he says that all sons are partakers of this shaping and molding of their heavenly father. And therefore, if we have, um, um, you know, spiritual fathers, humans who are spiritual fathers, then the same thing that true, um, you know, heavenly father and true spiritual fathers, their heart will be to shape and mold their son's lives, um, to become, um, um, everything that they're supposed to be in God, uh, to fulfill their potential in God, to know their identity in God, uh, to fulfill their destiny in God. Um, the last thing we need is illegitimate sons. But you know what it's, what it's actually saying is that um, if we're in the kingdom, but, but don't understand that God's our heavenly father and we're not allowing him to shape and mold our lives, then there's an, an Ill illegitimacy about our relationship with our heavenly father. But then also, if we, um, if we are not allowing spiritual fathers to um, shape and mold our lives because they have the heart of the heavenly father to do so, then there's an illegitimacy in the relationship as well. And, um, and we'll probably talk more about some of this stuff when we get to talk more specifically about sonship. Um, but of course, at the moment, we're focusing more on fathering. And um, so fathers want to shape and mold sons' lives because they want their sons to be true sons. And if you, um, if you read, you know, what Paul actually says about Timothy and uh, particularly, but also some of his, the other members of his apostolic team, uh, you know, throughout the epistles in the New Testament, you'll find that there's kind of a progressive progression of relationship, which I'll talk about at some point, um, which sons go through. Um, and, there is a point that we come to where we become true sons and what, and he's giving us the key here and it's how sons respond to how, a, to a father's shaping and molding of their lives on behalf of the heavenly father and with the, the heart of the heavenly father and the grace that our heavenly father uh, has given us to do this. And um, then he goes on and he says, furthermore, we've had human fathers who corrected us. And by the way, the word corrected, um, in the, in the Greek is from the same root word as chastening. So it's in the same ballpark. So we could actually say we've had human fathers who chastened us or who have shaped and molded us. Um, and we paid them respect. Now what that means is we honored their position. Pretty interesting, hey? That's actually what it means. We honored their position. And um, so we, we honor our heavenly father by... Uh, by receiving the, the, the things from him that shape and mold us into mature and true sons. But it's the same with, with spiritual fathers as well, that um, 
uh, and also with our human fathers. And the key to positioning ourselves to receive those things that will shape and mould us as true sons is by uh, honouring their position in our lives. So we honour our heavenly father for his position of preeminence as Lord and God and master and king in our lives. But then, uh, and we position ourselves as sons of our heavenly father. But we do the same with our human fathers in our family, but also it's the same principle with it, with spiritual fathers. And so um, uh, spiritual fathers must have the heart of the heavenly father and they must carry the grace that only the heavenly father can put on them to be spiritual fathers. But then sons, um, uh, to receive what comes from spiritual fathers, sons must honour their position in their lives and their position under God. Um, so this is not about um, spiritual fathers being seen to be perfect. In fact, Paul talks very much about the fact that he was anything but perfect and he went through all kinds of trials, uh, etc. Um, but he said that they, were, they, were, they should not allow those things to distract them from receiving from him because it's not about those things. It's actually about uh, having the heart of the Heavenly Father and the grace from the Heavenly Father to be able to father spiritual sons. Um, anyway, then he goes on and he says, um, if we uh, honour um, the position of our earthly fathers and our spiritual fathers, uh, how much more readily can we be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? And so this is a principle across the board in our relationship with our Heavenly Father, our relationship with our natural earthly fathers, but also in our relationship with spiritual fathers. And then he says, for they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, that is our God, he chastens us or shapes and molds us for our profit or for our benefit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. And this is the difference between our natural earthly fathers, you know, that they've raised us to the best of their ability, Paul's saying here, um, and they've raised us to, um, you know, to be successful in life, to be successful, mature adults. But our Heavenly Father, um, He actually shapes and molds us so that we'll benefit by partaking of His holiness. Because we know that there's that statement in the Old Testament, be holy as I am holy, God said. And, um, and so God's shaping and molding of us is what produces holiness in us. And God also uses people who fulfill the role of a spiritual father, which is the term we use, um, to do the same thing, to, to produce holiness in us so that we become partakers of that holiness. So to, so to be a partaker of the shaping and molding from a father causes us to be a partaker of, of our heavenly father's holiness. And so it, um, it, it brings us to the place where our lives reflect our heavenly father. And that's the, that's the, that's the aim. So that, um, you know, so, uh, cause, cause spiritual fathers don't, can't have their own agenda. Jesus didn't have his own agenda. The Holy Spirit doesn't have his own agenda. We can't have our own agenda. So it's, it truly is about having the heart of the heavenly father, having the grace that only the heavenly father can put upon our lives and speaking uh, you know, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, the things of truth that sons need to hear to shape and mold their lives to become like the Heavenly Father. That's, that's, the, that's the aim, to mature as sons so that they can also become fathers who produce sons because uh, this is the foundation of the kingdom of God. And um, so then, then, of course, he goes on and, and finishes this by, by saying, now no chastening seems to be joyful at the present. So there's parts of the shaping and molding that, um, you know, that we might you know, react to a bit or that we might um, find a bit painful, as it says here. But he says that afterward, after we've allowed, um, you know, God and as our heavenly father and also his word and the Holy Spirit and, and of course spiritual fathers to, to shape and mold the areas of our lives, it, it, it produces some great outcomes. And then, and it says it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, this is really interesting because all the way through this, this um, section of scripture, all of these verses, um, the, the, the consistent theme about chastening and correction, etc., is about um, shaping and molding. That's the starting point. And so God uses many things to shape and mold us as sons. But when we get to, the, to this last bit here, and it says, no shaping or molding seems joyful for the present, 
Why? Because it means adjustment. It means, uh, you know, that we have to um, uh, deny self, you know, and there's got to be death to self and respond, you know, to, um, to what our Heavenly Father's, you know, saying and doing, either directly with us or through a spiritual father. Um, and, um, um, but afterwards, in other words, after we've gone through that, whatever the adjustment might be happening, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, which, and, and the concept of righteousness in the Bible is God's right order of things, which is way bigger than just purity from sin. All right. That, that's definitely part of it, but it's a bigger concept. It's God's right order of things. So yes, it's purity, but it's also that we think God's thoughts. We know God's ways. We, we, um, we have God's ways established in our lives. We live life we, um, the way God would have us to because we think the way God thinks. And so it's about God's right order in every part of our lives. Um, and, and, and he says that this comes to those who have been trained by the shaping and molding. The concept for, for being trained here um, is pretty amazing. And um, I'm, I'm sure that Glenn will touch on a, a, a very similar thing when, he, when we get talking about sonship um, and, and also, uh, you know, how intimate the father-son relationship needs to be at times. You see, the, uh, the concept here in the Greek uh, was about uh, athletes who were practicing naked for, for, an upcom for the upcoming games in the Colosseum. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> All right, so athletes who are practicing naked because there were many of the games, competitions, fights, whatever, where they actually performed naked. And so they would, they would have to practice, you know, um, naked in order to then be effective to fight or to, to compete naked with, with others, whatever the games were in the Colosseum or, uh, you know, or whatever the, the actual uh, environment was or the facility was that the games might have been going on in either, either in Greece or in Rome or in some other part of the world at the time. But the interesting thing is that it gives us an insight into uh, again what chastening is about it's actually about um us being stripped back it's actually about us um you know the the, the very secret and private parts of our lives be, becoming exposed that's what nakedness is and so uh, our heavenly father of course he sees what nobody sees and we can't hide anything from him and so uh, there's no point trying to hide anything from our Heavenly Father because He sees and knows it all. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us better than anybody else on the planet knows us. And so in that sense, we are naked before Him. But the concept is that the, the effectiveness of chastening and the purpose of chastening, the shaping and molding, is all in this picture of being in the arena and actually being in practice and being... Um, being coached to be able to be uh, effective when the game, you know, when you're actually in the game, when you're in the competition. And, um, and so what God does is as a heavenly father is he actually, um, uh, he's training us like a coach and he's training us to be effective. He's training us to be, to be able to win, you know, uh, in whatever he's called us to be and do. He's, um, he, he's training us so that we can deal with anything in life and we can overcome, we can conquer, we can rule over what we conquer. Um, he's training us to be the head and not the tail. He's training us to be above and not beneath. And, and so therefore he's, he's training us so that we'll become partakers of his holiness, which, we, which means we become more and more like him so that we approach everything in life the way he would. And, and so we, we conquer and we rule. And, um, but the thing is that um, he knows our nakedness. He knows the, the depths of our soul. He knows the private thoughts. He knows all of those things. And, um, and, and the great news about that is um, he doesn't condemn us for any of it. <laughs> Isn't that great news? Right? Because he's a father who loves his sons and his aim is, to, is for us to be uh, in an ongoing sense, to be partakers of his holiness. And so this is where our Heavenly Father comes from. Because he loves us, 
He's shaping and molding us so that we become partakers of his holiness. And the picture Paul gives us is of um, a, an athlete who's in training. And it's a disciplined life when you're an athlete in training. It's, um, it's a, uh, there's a regime because you, you, you have to um, be at your peak when you're competing. And, and so it is with us as, as sons of a heavenly father. And, um, and, and this is what true spiritual fathers um, want to do in relationship with their spiritual sons and, and also what they want to produce with their spiritual sons because they have the heart of the heavenly father. And so the, the motivation is actually to, to be in the arena with your sons and you're their coach and they're naked. But that's not a problem because, you know, when, when, uh, when we're naked before a heavenly father, which we actually always are, but when we understand that and are prepared for him to, 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 um, to actually deal with anything in our lives that he, that he sees fit at any given time, um, then there, then there comes just such an openness and intimacy of relationship with God, uh, with our Heavenly Father, that he's able to fully shape and mold our lives. He's able to speak to, you know, um, draw our attention um, to the important things, as we talked about a few nights ago. He's able to um, argue for the right, as we talked about last night or the night before. You know, he's able to um, uh, shape and mold. He's able to instruct and, and adjust uh, so that, we become fit for the main game. And this is, this is the concept. And, um, uh, and so, um, like I said, when we come to talk about sonship, Glenn will have some interesting and more, um, more specific things, I'm sure one night say about these kind of areas. <laughs> but, um, but, but the whole point of it is this, that spiritual fathers can, in their shaping and molding of their sons, can only go as far as the sons are prepared to be naked be with them too. Did you get that? <laughs> so I know I've said a bunch of challenging things over the last week, all right? Um, but this is, we're starting to head into some of the most challenging area <laughs> because spiritual fathers need to be able to touch on, you know, the most intimate areas of, of a son's life. That's really what it's talking about. But the purpose is, a part of the training for the main game, part of the training to, um, you know, in the arena to compete and win, you know, to use that kind of picture, part of the training to deal with all the issues of life as a mature son and to, to overcome, to conquer, to rule over things, you know, uh, this is the purpose. But one of the reasons that father son relationships break down is when, uh, when sons don't want to be naked with their fathers and in the sense that sons don't want to um, allow fathers to see into areas of their lives in order to be able to bring adjustment and correction. And, you know, good fathers aren't just trying to be intrusive. You know, they're not, not trying to impose any of the stuff on, on sons. But if we understand this is what the father son relationship is with our heavenly father to us as his sons and also between um, spiritual fathers and their sons and there's there's um, uh, you know we can see that through the word of God including the New Testament uh, you know where um, where the apostle Paul circumcised Timothy because his father was a Greek and so therefore it sent a signal to everybody that now Paul was Timothy's father and he, he was his spiritual father and um, and so he dealt with the most um, intimate areas of Timothy's life in order for Timothy to become his spiritual son. And so um, th this is a very powerful principle. Um, uh, and, and like I said, it can't be imposed. It can't be enforced. Um, it, it's not about, um, uh, you know, forcing this onto anybody. This is about a relationship developing, firstly, where we understand we stand naked before our Heavenly Father and we're comfortable for Him to deal with anything in our lives. But then also we come to a place of relationship with a heavenly, with a, a spiritual father where one by one or step by step over time, you know, we allow a spiritual father to have access to different areas of our lives so that 
they can help us with the grace of the Heavenly Father and the heart of the Heavenly Father to be able to um, deal with those, those areas that are more and more intimate in our lives so that we can become true sons. Um, and in fact, there's a concept that I call brother son, which is in the New Testament and particularly between Paul and Timothy. And, and um, we'll get talking about that in time to come. Um, but fathers are uh, true fathers. They wait for sons to actually um, uh, expose themselves, if you will, for, you know, for the want of a better term. They wait for sons to, to become naked. In other words, to uh, put on the table some things that nobody knows so that they can get the help of their spiritual father along with their heavenly father by the work of the Holy Spirit to be able to touch on those things and, and shift those things in a son's life. So this whole thing of being a spiritual father is, um, um, this is a, a huge responsibility, uh, as I think, Charmaine, you, you mentioned uh, one night, but there's a grace for it. But also, like I said, it's not about imposing it, you know. Um, spiritual fathers have to wait until sons uh, come to them, you know, and say, hey, I want you to coach me like we're in the arena, you know. Um, and, and we're going to the naked games and I want to win. <laughs> and when sons do that then fathers can actually coach them in the way they that will produce um, maturity that will produce true sons and um, uh, and sons that ultimately become great fathers themselves spiritual fathers themselves so there's a, a, a few things to uh, well and truly uh, think about pray about mull over search the scriptures about um, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish there um, and then we can have some discussion but how about we pray Father, I thank you that your word is so vivid when it comes to the imagery, and yet it allows us to capture truth and to capture the concepts and principles of how you relate to us and how you would have us to, to um, disciple others and to, to, be, to be fathers and mothers to others. And, um, and, and Lord, I pray that, um, that Lord, that uh, as, as spiritual parents, Lord, that we will come to understand more and more our role in the light of what we've talked about tonight but also because we're all fathers and sons i pray that as 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 sons as as your sons our father but also as sons of of spiritual fathers i pray oh god that these things will begin to to um uh, illuminate for us um the the um uh the strength of the father-son relationship and the way we become partakers of your holiness and the ways towards maturity and to ultimately becoming spiritual fathers ourselves. And so God, I pray you seal these things in our hearts tonight and uh, let, let um, Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll continue to unfold revelation about them over this weekend in, in our hearts and minds so that we'll come to understand from both sides of the equation, what it means to be a son and what it means to be a father of a son um, uh, un under your leading, oh God. So we just commit these things to you now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 All right.